Hi everyone, welcome back to Reading Corner. I really hope that you're having a great day. I know that we've got some really lovely little golden books to read to you today and they all come out of this little golden book library, which was something that my parents read to me from when I was just a little person as well. So I really, really hope you enjoy these stories. The first story that we're going to read <clears throat> is called I Can Fly. It's about a little girl who loves to imitate animals. And I wonder whether, as you watch this, you might want to pretend to be the animals as well. So I'll read nice and slow so you can play along. <clears throat> a bird can fly, so can I. A cow can moo. I can too. I can squirm like a worm. I can grab like a crab. Crunch, crunch, crunch. I'm a goat, up to lunch. Who is busy like a bee? Me, me, me. Who can walk like a bug? Me, ug, ug. I'm merrier than a terrier. Swish, I'm a fish. Pick, 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 I'm a little chick. Who can live in a hole? Me, like a mole. Who can climb everywhere? Me, like a bear. My house is like a mouse's. A clam is what I am. Pop, pop, pop. I am a rabbit with a hop. Bump, bump, bump. I am a camel with a hump. Ho, ho, ho. I'm a donkey in the straw. Pit a pit a pat. I can walk like a cat. Ow, how, how. I'm an old screech owl. Gobble, gobble, gobble. I'm a mubble in a puddle. I can play, I'm anything that's anything. That's my way. Did you play along? I hope you did. It's lots of fun to pretend to be different kinds of things and use your imagination. Another person that used their imagination and got into all sorts of adventures was a little train called Tootle. See what happens to him. Far, far to the west of everywhere is the village of Lower Train Switch. All the baby locomotives go there to learn to be big locomotives. The young locomotives steam up and down the tracks, trying to call out the long, sad toot of the big locomotives. But 
the best they can do is a gay little doodle. Lower train switch has a fine school for engines. There are lessons in whistle blowing, stopping for a red flag waving, puffing loudly when starting, coming around curves safely, screeching when stopping, and clicking and clacking over the rails. Of all the things that are taught in lower train switch school for locomotives, the most important is, of course, staying on the rails no matter what. The head of the school is an old engineer named Bill. Bill always tells the new locomotives that he will not be angry if they sometimes spill the soup pulling the diner or if they turn the milk to butter now and then. But they will never, never be good trains unless they get 100 A plus in staying on the rails no matter what. <clears throat> All the baby engines work very hard to get 100 A plus in staying on the rails. After a few weeks, not one of the engines in the lower train switch school for trains would even think of getting off the rails, no matter. Well, no matter what. One day, a new locomotive named Tootle came to the school. He is the finest baby since I've seen, I've seen since old 600, thought Bill. He patted the gleaming young locomotive and said, how would you like to grow up to be the flyer between New York and Chicago? If a flyer goes very fast, I should like to be one, Tootle answered. I love to go fast. Watch me. He raced all around the roundhouse. Good, good, said Bill. You must study whistleblowing, puffing loudly when starting, stopping for a red flag waving, and pulling the diner without spilling the soup. But most of all, you must study staying on the rails no matter what. Remember, you can't be a flyer unless you get 100 A plus in staying on the rails. Tootle promised that he would remember and that he would work very hard. He even worked, and he did too. He even worked hard at stopping for a red flag waving. Tootle did not like those lessons at all. There is nothing a locomotive hates more than stopping. But Bill said that no locomotive ever, ever kept going when he saw a red flag waving. One day, while Tootle was practising for his lesson in staying on the rails no matter what, a dreadful thing happened. He looked across the meadow he was running through and saw a fine, strong black horse. Race you to the river, shouted the black horse and kicked up his heels. <clears throat> Away went the horse. His black tail streamed out behind him and his mane tossed in the wind. Oh, how he could run. Here I go, said Tootle to himself. If I am going to be a flyer, I can't let a horse beat me, he puffed. Everyone at school will laugh at me. His wheels turned so fast that they were silver streaks. The cars lurched and bumped together. And just as Tootle was sure he could win, the tracks made a great curve. Oh, whistle, cried Tootle. That horse will beat me now. He'll run straight while I take the great curve. Then the dreadful thing happened. After all that Bill had said about staying on the rails no matter what, Tootle jumped off the tracks and raced alongside the black horse. The race ended in a tie. Both Tootle and the black horse were happy. They stood on the bank of the river and talked. It's nice here in the meadow, Tootle said. When Tootle got back to school, he said nothing about leaving the rails. But he thought about it that night in the roundhouse. Tomorrow I will work hard, decided Tootle. I will not even think of leaving the rails, no matter what. And he did work hard. He practised tootling so much that the mayor himself ran up the hill, his green coattails flapping, and said everyone in the village had a headache and would he please stop tootling? So Tootle was sent to practise staying on the rails, no matter what. 
as he came to the great curve, Tootle looked across the meadow. It was full of buttercups. It's like a big yellow carpet. How should I like to play in them and hold one under my searchlight to see if I like butter, thought Tootle. But no, I am going to be a flyer and I must practice staying on the rails no matter what. Tootle clicked and clacked around the great curve. His wheels began to say over and over again, do you like butter, do you? I don't know, said Tootle crossly, but I'm going to find out. He stopped much faster than any good flyer ever does unless he is stopping for a red flag waving. He hopped off the tracks and bumped along the meadow to the yellow buttercups. What fun, said Tootle, and he danced around and around and held one of the buttercups under his searchlight. I do like butter, cried Tootle. I do. At last, the sun began to go down and it was time to hurry to the roundhouse. That evening, while the chief oiler was playing checkers with old Bill, he said, it's queer, it's very queer, but I found grass between Tootle's front wheels today. Hmm, said Bill, there must be grass growing on the tracks. Not on our tracks, said the day watchman, who spent his days watching the tracks and his nights watching Bill and the chief oiler play checkers. Bill's face was stern. Tootle knows he must get 100 A plus in staying on the rails no matter what if he is going to be a flyer. Next day, Tootle played all day in the meadow. He watched a green frog and made a daisy chain to wear. As the sun went down, he ran back to the rain barrel for one more toot toot before he went home. That night, the first assistant oiler said he had found a daisy in Tootle's bell. The day after that, the second assistant oiler said that he had found hollyhock flowers floating in Tootle's eight bowls of soup. And then the mayor himself said that he had seen Tootle chasing butterflies in the meadow. The mayor himself said that Tootle had looked very silly too. Early one morning, Bill had a long long talk with the mayor himself. When the mayor himself left the lower train switch school for locomotives, he laughed all the way to the village. Bill's plan will surely put Tootle back on the track, he chuckled. Bill ran from one store to the next, buying 10 yards of this and 20 yards of that and all you have of the other. The chief oiler and the first, second and third assistant oilers were hammering and sawing instead of oiling and polishing. And Tootle? Well, Tootle was in the meadow, watching the butterflies flying and wishing he could dip and soar as they did. Not a store in Lower Train Switch was open the next day and not a person was at home. By the time the sun came up, every villager was hiding in the meadow along the tracks and each of them had a red flag. It had taken all the red goods in lower train switch and hard work by the oilers, but there was a red flag for everyone. Soon, Tootle came tootling happily down the tracks. When he came to the meadow, he hopped off the tracks and rolled along the grass. Just as he was thinking what a beautiful day it was, a red flag poked up from the grass and waved hard. Tootle stopped, but every locomotive knows he must stop for a red flag waving. I'll go another way, said Tootle. He turned to the left and up came another waving red flag, this time from the middle of the buttercups. And when he went to the right, there was another red flag waving. There were red flags waving from the buttercups, in the daisies, under the trees, near the bluebird's nest, and even one behind the rain barrel. And of course, Tootle had to stop for each one, for a locomotive must always stop for a red flag waving. Red flags, muttered Tootle. This meadow is full of red flags. Whenever I start, I have to stop. Why did I think this meadow was ever such a fine place? 
Why don't I ever see a green flag? Just as the tears were ready to slide out of his boiler, Tootle happened to look back over his coal car. On the track stood Bill, and in his hand was a big green flag. Oh, said Tootle. He puffed up to Bill and stopped. This is the place for me, said Tootle. There is nothing but red flags for locomotives that get off their tracks. Hooray, shouted the people of Lower Train Switch and jumped up from their hiding places. Hooray for Tootle the Flyer. Soon, Tootle grew up and now he is a famous two miles a minute flyer and all the young locomotives listen to his advice. Work hard, he tells them. Always remember to stop for a red flag waving. But most of all, stay on the rails no matter what. What adventures Tootle had and he learned to stay on the rails, which is, I think, where we like all our trains to stay and we also like them to stop for red flags waving. And now our final story for today is about a tiny little girl who was so small, she was the size of your thumb, and so she was called Thumbelina. There once was a tiny little girl. She was sweet and pretty and no taller than your thumb, so Thumbelina was her given name. In a, a nicely varnished walnut shell made a bed for her with a violet petal mattress and a rose leaf coverlet. That was where she slept at night. But in the daytime, she played about in a small dish garden where she rode her tulip petal boat from side to side of a tiny flower wreathed lake. It was a most charming sight she made and she sang as she went in the sweetest little voice you ever heard. <clears throat> One night, as she lay in her pretty bed, a great ugly toad came hopping in through the open window and jumped straight to the table where Thumbelina was lying asleep. She would make just the wife for my son, thought the toad. So she snatched up Thumbelina, walnut shell and all, and hopped off with her back to the garden. There, in the muddy bank of a wide brook, the toad made her home with her ugly son. Now, while she decorated a room in their house with rushes and leaves for her daughter-in-law, the mother toad left Thumbelina in her walnut shell bed on a water lily leaf floating out on the brook. In the morning, when the poor little thing woke up and saw where she was, she cried most bitterly, for the big green leaf had water all around it, so she could not possibly escape. The little fishes swimming in the water below heard her crying. They had caught sight of the ugly mother toad and they knew what she had in mind. So they all swarmed around the tough green stalk that held Thumbelina's leaf and they gnawed it through with their teeth. Then the leaf floated with Thumbelina on it far away down the brook where the toad could never reach her. For a while, the journey was most pleasant for well, she was sailing through a lovely open part of the brook. But when her leaf boat swelled to a stop against a mossy bank, Thumbelina found herself alone in a strange forest world. She had no way to travel further. So all through the summer, Thumbelina lived quite alone in that enormous wood. From blades of grass, she wove a bed. This she hung neatly under a leaf where she was sheltered from the rain. For food, she had honey from the flowers and for drink, the morning dew on the leaves. And so she passed the summer and autumn. Then winter came, the bitter winter. All the birds flew away, the flowers withered, the great leaf under which she had lived shriveled to a faded yellow stalk. As Thumbelina searched for a new shelter, it began to snow. And every snowflake that fell on her was as if a whole shovelful were thrown on one of us. So delicate and tiny was she. On the fringe of the wood, she came at last to a field mouse's door. Down below the stubble of a large cornfield, the field mouse had a fine snug house 
with a whole storeroom full of corn. You poor little thing, said the kindly field mouse when she found Thumbelina shivering at her door. Come into my warm room and have a bite with me. The mouse took a liking to Thumbelina at once and invited her to stay for the winter. Just so you keep my rooms tidy and nice and tell me stories, she said. Thumbelina agreed and was comfortable there. In the evenings, the field mouse's neighbour often came to call. He was a tiresome old mole. But his house is even snugger than mine, the mouse said, and he wears such a lovely black velvet coat. If only you could get him for a husband, you'd be well off indeed. Thumbelina paid no attention to this. She had no intention of marrying the mole. He was very learned, she agreed, but he couldn't bear sunshine and flowers and said all sorts of rude things about them, though he had never seen them. Now, he had dug a long passage from his house to theirs, and there Thumbelina found a bird one day, a swallow, numb with cold and almost dead. She wove a fine big blanket of hay and, and she spread it over the swallow and tucked some cotton wool in at the sides. She brought him water in the petal of a flower and took care of him all winter long. When she was not caring for the swallow, Thumbelina spent her time spinning and weaving on her trousseau with the help of some spiders. For the tiresome mole had proposed to her and the mouse had decided they should be married soon. Poor Thumbelina. She grew sadder and sadder as the wedding day drew near. She would have to say goodbye to the sun and the flowers since the mole did not care for them. When spring arrived, bringing her wedding day and the sun began to warm the earth, Thumbelina opened a hole in the roof of the passage and the swallow stepped out into the pleasant sunshine. She watched him with tears in her eyes. Come with me, Thumbelina, he begged, for he could not bear to have her marry the mole and live forever underground. You can sit on my back and we shall fly far away to the warm countries where it is always summer with lovely flowers. Yes, said Thumbelina of a sudden, I will come with you. She climbed on the bird's back, settled her feet on its wings and tied her sash firmly to its feathers. Then the swallow flew high up into the air, over lakes and forests, high up over the mountains of everlasting snow. At last, they reached the warm countries where grapes grew on sunny walls and slopes and lemons and oranges ripened in the groves. The swallow flew on while the country became more and more beautiful until at last they came to an ancient palace of shining marble standing among green trees beside a blue lake. Here, the swallow flew down with Thumbelina. He placed her on a broad flower petal and there, in the middle of the flower was a little man no bigger than herself. He was the king of the spirits of the flowers. My, how handsome he is, Thumbelina thought. And the little king was equally enchanted at the sight of her. He took the crown from his own head and placed it on hers. Then he asked her what her name might be and if she would be his wife. She knew at once he was the husband for her, so she said yes to the king. Then, from every flower round about, a tiny lady or gentleman appeared. Each of them brought a gift for the new queen, but her favourite of all was a pair of beautiful wings from a white butterfly. These they fastened to her back so that she could flit with the others from flower to flower. Such rejoicing there was then and the swallow sat in his nest above and sang for their happiness with all his loving heart. The end. What a lovely bit of imagination and, and fairy story. Imagine a little tiny person who's so small she can sleep in a walnut shell and can go sailing on a, on a lily leaf just wonderful things to think about and watch the pictures and listen to the story. I really hope you enjoyed that today. 
and I'm looking forward to when I see you again. So in the meantime, you have a great rest of your day. Bye for now.